okay if you want to if you have a question or you want to ask me something you could put it in the comments and or save it for when we stop for questions so hi and hello uh today we are in the ninth day of tammuz and um the ninth the hayom yom for today is that the greatest guaranteed assurance of divine assistance for all Jewish parents in need of special help and deliverance for their children is through their support of those who study Torah. So that's just a, a, a plug for um, supporting the students of Torah. And I'll just read the Hayom Yom for yesterday because I liked it very much as well. It says that we find that Hashem's love for our father Avraham was mainly because he will command Yitzaveh, connected to the word mitzvah, his children and his household. Yitzaveh here connotes, brings into a communion <clears throat> with Hashem. <clears throat> All of Avraham's great avoda, his work in the test to which he was subjected, cannot be compared to his commanding others and bringing them into communion with God. In other words, to his bringing merit to others. So I think this is very interesting because we live in a time where even the idea of someone commanding someone else to do anything at all is like, you know, everybody could get very uptight. You know, you're telling me what to do. You're not leaving me freedom of choice. And the idea is of, of a Jewish uh, Masora or a Jewish tradition is that we have a particular set of values and we need to teach those values to our children and to the people we love and care about if we can, um, even those who are not our biological children, but people we can cultivate as students or people we can learn with. Why? Because we believe that we have something of value that you can't learn or, or access, you can't get by just looking at, you know, a book on the shelf. You have to learn it. And the mitzvot, which actually connect us to Hashem and to his divinity, we cannot get those, that connection unless we do the mitzvot. So when Abraham plays his responsible role as a mentor, a patriarch, a father of all of his children and his household and those people connected to him and he commands them and he instructs them and he directs them and he places and he provides a path for them so it says hashem has a lot of nachas from this and this was um and all of the work that he did in handling all of the tests that he had in keeping his connection with hashem all of that cannot be compared to the value of him connecting other people to Torah and mitzvahs, um, learning about them, the Torah, learning about the mitzvahs, and wanting to be connected. And then when they become connected, they get the merit, they get the illumination. We were speaking last week about light. They get the light of being connected to Torah and mitzvot. And that's a huge that's like, according to the Hayom Yom, that's the greatest thing that Abram did. Couldn't do a better thing, even if he, he tried. He couldn't do, he couldn't, that was the, the greatest thing that he could do. Now, it just reminds me of a Hayom Yom that we started a class with um, a week ago or two weeks ago when we said that given that it's so close to Mashiach's time now, we, um, we have to, we have to, <laughs> thank you, Karina. We have to um, try and connect as many Jews to, to Torah as possible. Because Mashiach is coming soon. We say that a lot of, and, and, and I want to preface what I'm going to say next, because we don't know when Mashiach is going to come. We don't have a guarantee that because the world is in such a state of, um, challenge and turmoil, it means that Mashiach is going to come in six weeks, uh, two months, three months, four months, we don't know, but we certainly can see that there's a lot of action and um, 
I was listening to a, a class today with Rabbi Shalom Aruch. Actually, he was speaking in Hebrew and someone was translating and they were talking about Aliyah and he said, they should, people should make Aliyah now because later they might not be able to do so. So I don't want to make anyone excited and Karina, I know this is a topic we've spoken about. It's not to put anybody in a panic, but in terms of in previous generations, we had lots and lots and lots of time to kind of work out our stuff and, and figure out, you know, are we interested in Israel? Do we want to go to Israel? Are we interested in mitzvahs? Are we interested in Torah? There was a sense that there was a lot of time. So in a sense, the, the Hayom Yom that we read is Mashiach is coming and we want people to be connected in so that they can get the benefit of being part of the Jewish people when whatever shift occurs actually occurs. So there is some sense of urgency. So on, on one hand, a person should take it seriously to connect other people who are not yet connected in to connect in because for their sake, we want them to be connected in so that when things change, they'll be in. It's almost like um, a lifeboat and we want everyone to be in the lifeboat because the sea is going to be a little rough. That's one aspect of it. And another aspect of it is that of all the things that Abraham did, this commanding his family and connecting people was a huge thing. So one point I wanted to make about that is not to be afraid to command, to direct our children, and that Hashem has commanded us, but the commands are all means of connection. So that's just by means of introduction, our um, Hayom Yom, our warm up for the day. So now um, coming into the Parshiot, so we have two parshas this uh, week. I was explaining that because um, we've been out of sync with Eretz Israel, they've been one parsha ahead of us for quite a few weeks. But after today, we're going to be back in sync with um, which parsha they're reading in Eretz Israel. So we have one parsha called Chukas, and the word Chukas is connected to. Uh, mitzvot that have no rational reason. There's chukat, mishpatim, and edut. Edut are testimonies. Um, uh, uh, chuks or chukas are from the chuks, they, they, they mitzvot that um, don't have rational reasons. And mishpatim are ordinances, different uh, things that keep a society running in a civilized way. So the, the test of the edut, the testimonies are such and such a, a event happened in such and such a time. And we have a holiday to acknowledge, to give testimony to the fact that certain things happened at a certain time. That's the edut. The um, mishpatim are, you should leave uh, a corner of your field for the poor people. When you, when you sow your fields, you shouldn't mix different species, uh, practical things like that. And then chokim are things that have no reason. And the Pasha opens with a very strange chok, uh, one about the red heifer, which is if a person is in a state of impurity while they were in the desert, moving in the experiences uh, traveling through the desert, if they were in a state of impurity, then they would need to get hold of uh, a cow that was 100% red. Every hair on that cow was 100% red. And they would um, shech the cow and then burn, uh, put it on a, on a, um, a sacrifice, get the, um, the ashes from this cow and use it in a ceremony, the, the Kohanim, would use it in a ceremony so that the person who was impure would become pure. And then the Kohanim who were actually officiating at that ceremony, who were previously pure, they would become impure. And there's a certain uh, ritual to it. And it's something that is a very important ritual, but it's something that's very hard to understand. And the whole point of it is it's in a way an aspect of our service to Hashem that we, we don't 
we don't do it because we understand it. We do it because Hashem commanded that we do it. So that's how the parsha uh, opens. And then we have um, the, um, the death of Miriam. So it's, uh, I'd, um, I'll just read it to you because it doesn't really say a whole lot in the Chumash about her. It just says when we start the second chapter in this, uh, in, in Parshas Chukas, it says the children of Yisrael, the entire community, came to the desert of Tzin in the first month, and the people stopped at Kadesh, and there Miriam died, and there she was buried. And that's all it says. And then the very, very next uh, verse says, but then there was no water for the community, so they congregated against Moshe and Aaron. And that's really all it says. So if, um, so Rashi says, first of all, why is this topic of Miriam coming right after this idea of the red heifer, that somebody who is impure can become pure through the sacrificial um, uh, offering? So Rashi says to teach us that just as the sacrifices can provide atonement uh, or purification, so to the death of the righteous can atone. So this isn't a Christian idea, although the Christians certainly use this idea. But if um, Hashem feels that a certain debt needs to be paid or there's a certain imbalance, there's a certain um, something needs to occur um, for Hashem to be happy with the people again, possibly. So the death of a tzaddik can be an atonement. It's written here right in uh, Rashi. So it says, Miriam died with a kiss. She died with a kiss. She was righteous and it was just Hashem decided it was time to, for her to die. So she died in, in this way. Um, uh, um, okay. So then, um, and then suddenly it says that there's no water for the community. And then Rashi tells us from here we derive, because these two verses are put so close together that Miriam died and then that they didn't have water. So we can derive that for the entire 40 years that they were in the well, they had water in the merit of Miriam. So um, just a few little facts. Miriam dies, it's the 10th, it's the 10th of Nisan when she dies. And they enter into Eretz Israel exactly a year later, on the 10th of Nisan. One year later, they enter into Eretz Israel. So this is at, Miriam dies at the end of all, all the uh, 39 years of wandering, because we, uh, I guess they were wandering and wandering, and after 40 years, they enter into Eretz Israel. A little later, we read about the death of Aaron. So this Pasha is really a little bit of a transition Pasha. All of, the, um, all of the people that came out of Egypt are, have passed away. Most of them have passed away. And the, the nation that's going to go into Eretz Israel is really a different nation. And it's interesting to look at the, the different nature of one generation to another. So a lot of the people... We know that when the spies came back and they spoke Lush and horror about the land of Israel, people were very upset. They were crying. They felt they bought into the narrative of the spies. And so Hashem said, I'll give you something to cry about. None of you are going to enter into the land of Israel. So they were all feeling very upset. And I think, welcome, welcome to our newcomers. So they were feeling... Um, they get punished and they don't have the merit to enter into Eretz Israel. And then Miriam dies and Aaron's going to die in this Parsha. And we're going to see also that there's a decree made that, that Moshe is going to die. So all of these um, leaders end up passing away 
in this Pasha before we move into um, the next generation and the next parts of what happens, which is the conquering of the nations who are occupying the land between where they are now and entering into the land and taking occupation in the land. And we know that through this Pasha, they try to pass through the land of Edom, who doesn't let them, doesn't even want them passing through at all, even though they say that they'll pay for their water, they'll, you know, they'll be very law abiding. And Sichon doesn't let them pass, pass through their land either. So before I move on to the other topics, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Miriam. We know that she was an incredible Sudeikis and um, uh, we know that the Talmud explains that while the Yidden were in the desert, moving through the desert, they had different gifts in the merit of Miriam, Aaron and Moshe, that in the merit of Miriam, they had the well, um, in the merit of Aaron, they had the pillar of clouds that kept them kind of protected. And in the merit of Moshe, they had the man. So all of these are also um, connect to different aspects of Torah learning, but the well itself is uh, always, we always associate water with Miriam. And so when the water, when the, when the well no longer was there, right away we have contention. Now, I don't know, I remember teaching this last year talking about the fact that, uh, that Miriam played a role, not only was the water in her merit, but if we say water was Torah, that maybe Miriam was able to provide an aspect of Torah teaching. We know she was a leader of the Jewish woman, and we know that Jewish women have um, an extra level of Bina, Bina Yesera, it's called, so that women have this extra ability to interpret and dilute and chew on and digest the Torah learning so that while Miriam was around, the Torah that they were experiencing, maybe she had an ability to put it into words that the woman could receive and the woman could then speak with their husbands. As soon as she was no longer there, not only was the water temporarily taken away, but immediately there was strife and the people are complaining right away to Moshe and Aaron. So why does Miriam have this merit that in this um, schus, this merit that because of her, the Yidden could have this access to water? And I've explained um, many times that the water was actually in the form of a rock that I've now learned was sort of like a sieve and the water was inside the rock, but kind of uh, flew, uh, flowed out of the holes in the rock. So the rock was kind of like a, a giant sieve with the water inside it. And then when they would stop, the water would drain out of, of the rock and, and form canals that would go to the different camps of the Yidden. So the Zohar explains that Miriam had this um, merit because A, the way she stood by her brother and watched him when he was placed in, um, into a basket when, when he, her brother Moshe was very little. That's one reason she was so, um, she showed such midot of care and concern around what could have been a dangerous body of water, the Nile, and she was watching. The second thing, the Midrash says that she has this connection to water because when they crossed through the, the, the Yamsuf, the Red Sea, and it split her singing and her joyfulness and her, her dance with the cymbals and the tambourines and these special drums that they had. Um, actually, the tambourines, this, uh, did they have drums? Did they have tambourines? I think maybe they had both. But she led the woman in song in such an exuberant way her gratitude was so enormous and expansive that that's one of the reasons why she, she had the merit to be, to connect to the water in this way. And um, so that's two reasons why she had this merit. 
And then we know from Pirke Avot, and I've referred to this Mishnah many times, that during the days of creation, creation um, went from uh, separating the, there was the, there was water and then the water got separated into upper waters and lower waters. And then the lower waters got gathered so that there would be land and there would be sea. And then there was sun and moon. And then there was birds and fishes. And then there was, uh, sorry, before birds and fishes was plants. And then birds and fishes, then animals, then mankind, then womankind. And then at twilight, on the very last day of creation, on the sixth day of creation, at twilight, there were 10 things created that are somewhat physical, but somewhat spiritual. And it says that at that moment, twilight before Shabbat, one of the things that got created was this miraculous well of Miriam that was in the form of a rock that rolled, that always had water that sustained them. Uh, and, and that's very beautiful. And if you want to know what happened to the well. So there's, I always just uh, simply explained that the well um, flowed into the Kinneret and in the Kinneret there's a spe spe specific place where it is. And I've often told the story that the student of Rabbi Chai, uh, of the Arizal um, was Rabbi Chaim Vital. And the Arizal took him on a boat ride and he uh, stopped in the middle of the lake and he told his student Rabbi Chaim Vital to take a cup and he drank from the Kinneret at a certain spot and then his mind became expanded and he could understand all of his teacher's Torah. But um, there's more details to it that actually Rabbi Chaim Vital explains and if anybody goes to uh, Tiveria and goes to the Kinneret, if you remember this or know that it's written somewhere, that as you walk along the shore of, this, of the Kinneret towards the hot springs of Tiveria, at the exact midway point in a place where there are many palm trees on the seashore, parallel to the tower that is on top of the mountain, that is where um, the, the well of Miriam is. But that's not the only account. In the Talmud, it says that a person should climb to the top of Mount Carmel and look out to the Mediterranean Sea, and you'll see a rock that looks like a sieve in the sea, and that is Miriam's well. And one more further interesting thing just to tell us about Miriam's well, because I find it very interesting, and of course, Miriam is. Um, has a tremendous schus because Miriam was the leader of the woman. And we learn that we got out of Egypt and that the redemption was in the merit of the woman. And Miriam was the leader of the woman. So she's a, a hugely important person, although in the Chumash there's just very, very little written about her. And I've made reference to this book by Melinda Ribner, um, that has a beautiful chapter interviewing biblical women and has a beautiful chapter on Mary. But in the words of the Midrash, listen to this. There was once a man with a skin disease who went down to immerse himself in the Sea of Tiberias. The well of Miriam appeared to him and he was healed. And where can it be found? Rabbi Chia Bar Abba said, it is written and it looks on the face of the Yeshimon, the wilderness. For anyone who goes up to the mountain Yeshimon, he will see something like a small sieve in the Sea of Tiberias, and that is where the well of Miriam is. So um, I just want to say, yes, yeah, so we know that the clouds were in the merit of Aaron, and uh, the, the man was... Um, Hang on, let me make sure that I say it right. That um, that uh, the 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 water was Miriam, the clouds um, I believe were Aaron, and the man was Moshe. So I'll pause the video for a moment. 
Okay, so uh, we have all these beautiful, um, beautiful ideas about the, the rock, Miriam's well, and um, the importance of Miriam. Just one other thing to say about Miriam is that it says that when we drink hot liquids or freshly brewed tea or after Shabbat, if we reboil water or draw water, um, it's somehow mystically, magically, I'm not quite sure, connected to Miriam's well. And some people have the custom to make sure to boil fresh water on Motzei Shabbat to drink with the Malava Malka, and somehow that connects us to Miriam's well. So moving on in, in, in the um, story, the next part of the of Pasha's Chukas is a very, very dramatic story. And the story is all about this idea that um, they didn't have water. And why they didn't have water, we just said, because Miriam passed away and in, it was in her merit that the water was there. And then the people quarreled with Moshe and said to him, if only we had died just like our brethren before, why did you bring us here so we would have to die? And they're feeling very thirsty. We've already explained that this thirst is also a thirst for accessing the information, accessing Torah. Maybe it was an absence of Torah inspiration altogether. Why did you take us up from its rhyme to bring us to this terrible place? It's not a place suitable for planting nor are there fig trees, vines, or pomegranate trees, then there's no water to drink. You can see from my background, they're in the desert. They haven't yet come into Eretz Yisrael. And um, I like the question that was asked about Eretz Yisrael. And all of what they're doing is this journey to try and come into Eretz Yisrael. Um, and part of the story is leading to a great tragedy. And the tragedy is that Moshe Rabbeinu is denied entry into Eretz Israel because of what happens next. So they're complaining and they're, and they're moaning and they're groaning and no fig trees, no vines, no pomegranate trees, no water to drink. So Moshe and Aaron then went from before the congregation to the entrance of the oil Moed and they fell on their faces and Hashem appeared to them. And Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, Take your staff, take your staff. And now we've known the staff. Moshe has done a lot of amazing things with the staff. He's come to Paro, he's thrown it down, it's turned into a snake, he's held it up by the Yamsuf and it's split the Yamsuf. He's done a lot of very powerful things with this stick. But he says, take this staff, stick, assemble the community you together with Aaron, your brother, and you shall speak to the rock. Now note, he says, you shall speak to the rock in full view of the people, and it will produce its water. You will thus bring forth water for them from the rock, and you shall then give the community and the animals to drink. Now it's interesting because, um, I'll just read a little bit more. Moshe took the star from its place before Hashem, just as he commanded. He assembled the congregation in front of the rock, now, Rashi says this, this is a miraculous thing because all of the people assembled in front of the rock, there was some kind of miracle that they all felt like they were right in front of the rock, which is very interesting um, about this rock, that they should feel so connected to it that they should all feel like they were right in front of it. And Moshe said to them, listen now, and he gets angry because they've been moaning and groaning. He says, listen now, and he calls them, you fools. Well, that's not what it says in the, hum in the Humash, but that's the English translation. From this rock we shall bring forth, from this rock shall we bring forth water for you. Now, the Mephoshim explained that, I don't know how big this rock was, but in a way, it explains that the rock somehow rolled away from being right in front of them. They weren't so sure which rock it was. And at this point, Moshe is not quite sure which rock it is that's the right rock which will give forth water. And then what did he do? He raised his hand and he struck the rock twice with his staff and then water came out and everybody drank. But 
Hashem said to Moshe and Aaron, because you didn't believe in me and you didn't sanctify me in full view of the children of Israel, you will therefore not bring this congregation to the land that I have given them. Now, this is a very intense story. And the reason, the official reason why Moshe didn't bring them is that instead of talking to the rock and letting the people see that just through talking to the rock, he hit the rock. Um, and in hitting, he was maybe checking, is this the right rock? Which rock is it? But he hit the rock and um, he was punished because he should have spoken to the rock. Now, I, I have a, my husband has a cousin who lives in Eretz Israel, who's a Rosh Yeshiva of a beautiful Hesden Yeshiva called um, Utniel. And uh, his name is Yaakov Nagen, and he's written a book on the Parsha. And he said a very, very beautiful thing. And it's such a beautiful idea in terms of Chinuch, because what he said is that for the old generation that came out of Egypt that had previously been living and dying in the desert, the way of parenting or of leadership was different. And Moshe could take his staff and be very vigorous and kind of assertive and authoritarian. And the way he moved and acted with that uh, staff was kind of in a very authoritarian manner. But now they were going into Eretz Israel, and it was a different generation. And what was demanded from or expected or requested from Moshe is that he should use different language and that in, or different way of being. Instead of striking the rock, he was meant to speak to the rock. But he was still attached to his old way of being. And that in a way, when um, you didn't sanctify me in full view of the Bnei Israel, and you'll therefore not bring this congregation to the land, it could be that you're not, you're not a fit anymore for this people. They need someone who can speak to the rock and you're still hitting the rock. You're still um, kind of attached to an old mode of leadership. So this is just a short idea but I think a very deep idea, which is um, food, I think, for further reflection and further learning on, on your behalf. Um, but what I want to talk about a little bit more is just about Eretz Israel in itself. So I was listening to an interview today on YouTube uh, between uh, it was an interview, questions asked to Rabbi Shalom Aruch, but he was interviewed together with um, Shlomo Katz. And there's a big effort now, there's Aliyah campaigns and a lot of the teachers and a lot of the people in Eretz Israel are finding different ways to encourage people in America um, to make uh, Aliyah. Or even if it's not to make Aliyah officially to move to Eretz Israel, which I guess everybody will just means Aliyah. So Shlomo Katz brought a, a verse that I don't, I didn't, I was making beds for my upcoming guests. So I was listening and I didn't pay attention to the exact verse. But the idea of it was that while the Jews were trying to Eretz, enter into Eretz Israel, they fought a battle at a place called Cheshbonot. Now Cheshbonot means calculations. And Shlomo Katz said an amazing, amazing thing. It was so deep. He said that people who don't move to Eretz Israel are a lot of times caught in the fact that they're making calculations and they're saying it won't work out. And he said, and I'm quoting him, a lot of times the calculations are financial around making, you know, how they're going to make money and support themselves. He said, the way to move to Eretz Israel, and in a way, the only way that you can move to Eretz Israel is when you suspend on some level some of the Cheshbonot, which is so interesting that they fought a battle in a place called Cheshbonot to get in. Rabbi Arush also said, you know, that his family, he's an immigrant, his family came from Morocco, and they were talking about just this idea of suspending a certain rational calculation in order to 
be able to make the jump into Eretz Yisrael. Now, Susan, you asked why, what, what can we learn to get an appreciation of Eretz Yisrael? So there's a book called Aim Banim Smecha, which is written, um, I can send you the name of the person who wrote it. His name uh, just escapes me now, but the name of the book is Aim Banim Smecha, the mother of sons are, are joyful. It's all about the joy of living in Eretz Yisrael and the great spiritual mitzvah of it. And Shlomo Katz said something today which completely blew me away. He said, Rav Cook uh, felt that he was the reincarnation of the Neshom of Rebbe Nachman of Breslev. Because people said to him, sometimes he was speaking and teaching the Torahs of Reb Nachman, and they said, why don't you just call yourself Reb Nachman? So much of what you're saying is from Rebbe Nachman, and there's some story there that um, Rav Cook said that he felt that he was a reincarnation of Rebbe Nachman. But that's um, an aside, but Rabbi Rav Cook, any teachings of Rav Cook will, will um, tell you about the great mitzvah and the great benefit of living in Eretz Yisrael, but simply put, if a person is created and each, per or let's start with flowers or we'll start with plants or plants as they say here in America. So each plant has a particular environment that will enable it to flourish. So a rhododendron, for example, needs acidic soil. When you give it acidic soil, it's gonna give you beautiful flowers. If the soil is too alkaline, alkaline it's not going to you know, be so, um, uh, abundant and, and, and able to produce so many flowers or hydrangeas will, you know, each kind of flower has a soil that's most suitable for it. So the soul of a Jewish person apparently is matim, is fitting to the land of Eretz Yisrael so that when we in that place um, on a soul level, our spiritual development can be more at we're more in sync with our environment. But I'll just say one more thing and then I'll open to comments and questions. Rav um, Shlomo Katz taught a, a, a lesson on the Pasha, and I'm not sure if it was, maybe it was Shlach, I'm not sure. Um, my husband told it over to me. But he said that basically when people are in, 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 in Chutz Laaretz, outside of Israel, things work. You plant um, plants in the ground and, and generally they grow and you, you make your effort and there's um, pr pr um, productivity from your efforts. But in Eretz Yisrael, a lot of times things don't work. They don't work in a rational way. Things are very different. So people who go to Eretz Yisrael have to be ready for a lot of um, self-nullification, a lot of bittle because things don't, you have to give up on certain ways of being in order to thrive there. And one of the ways of being that one has to give up is, this is what he said, thinking that you can be an expert. Then in Chutz Laaretz, you can be an expert in something, but in Israel, you won't be because Israel is meant to train you in humility. Which is interesting because a lot of doctors and neuroscientists and astrophysicists from Russia came to Israel and then they sweeping streets because Things are different over there. So the land of Israel is matim. It's suitable to our spiritual makeup, number one. Number two, it's the promised land. It's a mitzvah to live there. Number three, in order to live there, though, one has to suspend a certain rational way of thinking and evaluating things because in order to get there, you have to fight the battle of chesh benot. Um, I don't know if there's anything else I want to say before we break for questions. Let me just think. Because we know that the whole point of our existence in this world is to turn the land and to make it fruitful. So the fact that Eretz Yisrael is a place that we cultivate and try and turn it into an abundant and, and fruitful and um, uh, financially viable place in order that from there it says Torah mitzion tzay tzay Torah from Zion the Torah is going to go out to the whole world from Israel when Israel is strong and um, successful as it is becoming in our times 
So the messages of truth and other um, knowledge goes out to help the whole world. And Baruch Hashem, we've already seen that. Israel is um, giving advice on security, cyber security, fighting terrorism, agriculture, water, all kinds of things, technology, coronavirus fighting. A lot of things are coming from a strong and um, um, I'm trying to find the word, successful uh, country and benefiting the whole world. So we wanna be part of that. That's a reason to go. And um, I don't need to tell you a lot of rabbis are speaking about the fact that if one reads the writing on the wall, it just might be a safe place for Jews to be at this time. So I'll end the recording. Um, bless everybody with um, a, bless everybody with health and with safety most of all. Th these are very challenging times and no matter where we are, we know that Hashem is watching us and protecting us. And no matter where we are, if we stay focused and we stay connected to Torah and to mitzvahs and to helping people and being sensitive to people and listening to people and being kind to people and being connected to Hashem, please God will be safe wherever we are because that's, that is really our raft through these rocky waters of turbulence is connection to Hashem, no matter where we are. And the Rebbe has always taught that wherever you are, make that place where you are into Eretz Yisrael. And we've said Eretz Yisrael is connected to the word Ratz, which means God's Ratzon. Wherever you are, do God's will. And when you, when you do God's will, you're jumping into the lifeboat, so to speak, of the Eretz Yisrael headspace lifeboat. Wherever you are, be doing God's will. But if you were thinking that it's a good idea one day eventually to think about going to Eretz Israel. It might be a good idea to think about it sooner rather than later. So I bless everybody with good health and safety and Rufur Shalema to Shoshana Basbilia, who's still looking for a Rufur Shalema, needing one and wanting one. And um, um, all the people who need Rufur, everyone, Anyone on the call, anyone not on the call, anyone listening to the call, if anyone needs a Rufu Shalema, they should have a Rufu Shalema. And we should see the Geula Shalema. Just one more word, Geula Shalema. Gola is Galos, Geula is redemption. And the only difference between the two words is the Aleph, which is the perception of Hashem in everything. And we should see Hashem revealed in everything, in all aspects of our life. And I will await questions. Thank you so much. If you're listening after the live call, please email me or text me any questions or comments. I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much.